glared at the children a shaggy dog that should have been white came bounding across the cave. It protectively jumped between the tramp and the children, barking fiercely at Armand. The hobo quickly maneuvered his buggy between himself and the dog. If that beast bites me, he cried, I'll sue you for 10,000 francs. The girl called the dog to her. Here, Jojo, come Jojo. He won't take us away. He's only a funny old tramp. The dog stopped barking and sniffed at the wheels of Armand's baby buggy. The man was insulted. I'll have you know that I'm not just any old tramp, he said. And he wasn't. I'm not friendless and I could be a working man right now if I wanted. But where are your parents? And who are you hiding from? The police? He studied the children closely. Redheads they were, all of them. And their clothes had the mismatched, ill-fitting look of poverty. The older girl's eyes burned a deep blue. Our landlady put us out because we don't have enough money to pay for the room since Papa died, she explained. So Mama brought us here because we haven't any home now. And she told us to hide behind the canvas so nobody could see us or they'd take us away from her and put us in a home for poor children. But we're a family, so we want to stay together. I'm Susie, and they're Paul and Evelyn. The boy swaggered a little. If I was bigger, I'd find a new place for us to live, he boasted. Oh, it looks like to me you've already found a new place, said Armand, and it's my old place. You've put me out of my home just like that landlady did to you. Susie was apologetic. She moved the push cart over and measured Armand with one closed eye. Then she carefully drew a long rectangle on the concrete with a piece of soft coal. That's your room, she said. You can live with us. On second thought, she scrawled a small checkered square at the foot of the rectangle. There's a window she said gravely, so you can look out and see the river. Armand grumbled to himself and pulled his coat tighter across his chest as if there was no, as if to hide his heart. Oh, this starling was a dangerous one. He'd better move on. Paris was full of bridges. The way the Seine meandered through it, no trouble finding another one. But as he started away, the girl ran over and clutched him by the torn sleeve. Please stay, she begged. We'll pretend you're our grandfather. Armand snorted. Little one, he said, next to a millionaire. A grandfather is the last thing I hope to be. But even as he grumbled, he started unpacking his belongings. He stacked the branches and twigs and made a pile of the dead leaves he had gathered. He pulled out a dirty canvas and an rusty iron hook. He set a blackened can with a handle near the leaves. He sorted some bent spoons and knives. Last of all, he pulled out an old shoe with a hole in the sole. Might come across its mate one of these days, he explained to the children, and it fits me just right. The children wanted to help him. Oh, these starlings were clever. They knew how to get it around an old man. Lucky he wasn't their grandfather but he laid the canvas over the rectangle Susie had made for him. He started a fire with the branches and the dead leaves, and then he hung a big can over the fire. Into it, he dropped scraps of food he unwrapped from pieces of newspaper. In the good old days of Paris, he told the children, they used to ring bells in the marketplaces at the close of the day, so the tramps would know they were welcome to gather up the leftovers. But no more. Nowadays, we have to look after ourselves. They watched him eating his food. Even the dog that should have been white watched each morsel that went into his mouth and drooled on the concrete. Armand wriggled uneasily. What's the matter? He said gruffly. Haven't you ever seen anybody eat before? They said nothing in reply, but four pairs of eyes followed each move of his tin spoon. Oh, I suppose you're hungry, he growled. Starlings have to be eaten. Get your tinware. 
Susie pulled some stained crack poles and twisted spoons from the push cart. Armand carefully divided the food, even counting in the dog. It was dark by the time the children's mother joined them. The lights of Paris were floating in the river, but the only light in the tunnel flickered from a tiny fire Armand had made. He could not see the woman's face well, but he felt the edge of her tongue. What are you doing here? She demanded of the hobo. Armand was angered. Well, I might ask you the same thing, madame, he retorted. You've taken my piece of the bridge. The bridges don't belong to anybody, said the woman. They're the only free shelter in Paris. Susie tried to make peace. He's a nice, friendly old tramp, Mama, she explained, and he's going to live with us. I'm not a friendly old tramp, said Armand. I'm a mean, cranky old tramp, and I hate children and dogs and women. Then if you hate us, said Paul, why did you give us some of your food? Because I'm a stupid old tramp, <laughs> replied Armand. Because I'm a stupid, soft-hearted old tramp. Oh, la, la. There it was. He had let it slip that he really had a heart. Now this homeless family would surely be after that too. The mother was displeased to hear that the children had accepted the hobo's food. We are not beggars, she reminded them. I have a steady job at the laundry and that is more than he can say. She went to work warming a pan of soup and breaking a long loaf of bread that she had brought with her. Armand sat in the rectangle marked by Susie and thought that his woman's trouble was pride and that pride and life under the bridge were not going to work out too well together. By the dying light of the fire, the woman went back and forth to her push cart, pulling out moth-eaten blankets and making bed places on the concrete. Just overhead, the automobiles roared and the lights garlanded the bridge and people walking along the higher K laughed lightly but it could have been a million miles away from the little group under the bridge. You ought to put them starlings in a charity home until you find a place of your own, madame, suggested Armand after the children had dropped off to sleep. This life is not for them. Now you wouldn't want them to end up like me, would you? Families should stick together through the lean times as well as the fat, replied the woman, and I have hopes. I'm going to see my sister-in-law soon. She may know of a place for us out in Cliché. Armand stretched out his canvas without bothering any covering. He was used to the cold. He never felt it anymore. But he was sure that these children could feel it. And as he lay on the hard concrete, an uneasy thought worried him, like a mouse gnawing at a shoestring. Now that he had befriended these starlings, his life would never again be completely his own. When gray morning seeped into the blackness under the bridge, Armand woke to find the woman gone and the three children feeding some stale bread to Jojo. Are you still here? Asked Armand. Don't you go to school or something? Susie shook her head. We can't go to school again until we get a place to live. Mama says the teachers might begin asking us questions. Then the people would take us away from her and put us in a home. Your mama wants you around more than I do said Armand. Children should go to school. Where would I be today if I hadn't gone to school when I was a starling? Oh, I like school, said Susie, with her blue eyes glowing. I like to read and write. I want to be a teacher when I get big. See, a man on a barge threw this piece of coal at me, and I use it for a pencil. I hope we'll be able to go back to school soon again. Oh, then that's where we're different, confessed Armand. I never did like school, but you surely have to go someplace during the day. Your mama can't expect me to be a nursemaid. I've got places to go. <gasps> oh, may we go with you, begged Susie. Evelyn is a real good walker. She won't get tired. No, cried Armand in alarm. You can't go with me, and that's the whole cheese of it. Please take us, old tramp said Paul. It's so cold hiding down here with nothing to do. Well, that's not polite, Paul, warned Susie. Now he won't take us with him unless you apologize. But what can I call him, said Paul. I don't know his name. 
What is your name, sir? asked Susie. Armand, replied the hobo. But your last name, asked Paul. Ours is Calce. Armand shrugged his shoulders. I've forgotten, he admitted. I think it used to be Pooley or Pooji, something like that. Just call me Armand. All right, Mr. Armand, said Paul. I apologize for calling you an old tramp. Now will you take us with you? Of course he will, said Susie quickly. He really has a good heart, even if he looks so bad. And may Jojo go too? Armand clutched at the part of his coat covering his heart. Oh, these starlings were after it all right. Oh, la la, he exclaimed. And where would I be seen with three children and a dog? He demanded. What friend would want me dropping in with such company? And then a sly look crossed his weather-beaten face. Perhaps it wouldn't be a bad idea to take these appealing fledglings out on the street with him. <gasps> no, indeed. He had a splendid idea. Of course, it wasn't just the thing of which the mother would be proud. How would you like to go uptown and meet my friend, Father Christmas? He asked the children. They were so astonished that they couldn't speak for a few seconds. Susie's eyes grew bluer and bluer and wondered, oh, Father Christmas, she finally exclaimed in a hushed voice, the Father Christmas who brings presents at Christmas time? Paul could hardly believe it. Do you know Father Christmas? He asked. Mama said he won't bring us anything this year because he won't be able to find us, said Evelyn. Well, then we're going right up to the lower department store, declared Armand, and we're telling him where you're living.